So I, I thought it'd be, we thought it'd be great to finish off as a recent story. You've probably heard me mention Tony sort of a couple of times. The funny thing is, is we're just having a chat outside and one of the talks that I give to every single company, and I'll sort of mention this tonight, sort of do our welcome function and I'll mention it to everyone like at, at the function is that what this is about, this whole game, is manufacturing serendipity. It's about creating an opportunity out of thin air. When we're under pressure, everything, you know, feel like, you know, or when we're under pressure or we feel like everything's winning or whatever the situation may be, our job is just that continuous pushing forward and the creation of opportunities, right? So what I really love about Tony as a story is we were following, you know, we, we were, I, I, I'd heard about Booktopia through our shareholder, which is Investec, and also his relationship with the, is it the Online Retail Association? Yeah, so I, that was the first time I started hearing of uh, Booktopia, and then like, from the business perspective, obviously I'd seen their website before, and then I heard at one stage that, you know, then I heard that he was looking to go down the path of uh, equity crowdfunding. I thought, wow, that's interesting. And then when I read in the media interview, he's probably amazed I remember this, but I remember that he wanted to prove that a different model was possible for the, the sort of cap rates and he believes in the power, you know, he believes in the power of online as, as an area of disruption, right? So for me, the sort of philosophy is aligned and I don't, I don't know how much he knew about wholesale investor beforehand, but I remember having our chat just before participating and I was pretty excited to have Booktopia as a client because of their size, because of their presence, and also because I think they were sort of a bit misunderstood in some ways from, from the people we were speaking with. So, you know, I think it's a perfect style. I'll let Tony tell a bit about his story and then we'll start talking about the capital raising journey. Okay. Um, has anyone heard of Booktopia here? Great. Why haven't you not? Why? <laughs> what the hell? Where have you been? Um, so Booktopia started as a, as a side project in 2004 on a $10 a day budget. I was running an internet marketing company with my brother and my sister and my brother-in-law. So uh, it was just a side project uh, because we had got Angus and Robertson to the top of Google and that introduced us to the book industry and so I started it uh, just as a side project. It kept getting bigger and bigger. It took me three days to sell the first book, uh, $2,000 in the first month, uh, $30,000 in the fourth month, $100,000 a month by the end of the year, $200,000 a month by the end of two years. So we unexpectedly, with no plan, ended up with a two million dollar two million dollar online store, which I thought maybe pretty someone, much everyone's dream is to accidentally uh want a two million dollar business. But everyone does that. <laughs> I thought everyone that you get here does that. Um, anyway, so we thought someone might want to buy it. But if we were using it we were outsourcing our website fulfillment to another company who had managed was managing about eighty bookstores websites and it wouldn't take someone too long through due diligence to work out actually we, we were just a marketing front and there was the company behind us doing all the fulfillment, running all the websites. Because my background and my brother-in-law's background before I started the internet marketing was um, IT, um, we decided to build our own website and do our own fulfillment, uh, of which we did in 2007, so three years after uh, getting going. Business continued to grow, I think, uh, so that 10 years ago we had just moved 500 square meters into 2,000 square meters. It uh, took a ten year, uh, five year lease, I uh, thought that would last us. Uh, two years later we had to get another 2,000 square meters. And then in 2014 we moved to 10,000 square meters. Uh, we had about 58 employees and we're turning over 40 million, so that was middle of 2014. Um, another adjoining building became available, so we took over that and we, we went to 13,000 square meters. We, we have $10 million of automation. We've got about $9 million of stock, uh, 250 staff. We're the only company ever to make the BRW, now the AFR, Fast 108 times. We've donated over a million dollars in cash and books to literacy projects. We build our own website, uh, uh, warehouse management system, internal software systems, and, and everything came out of the $10. So, uh, when they talk about ah, oh, bootstrap companies, uh, we'll do around 175 uh, million in revenue this year. We um, we bought Angus and Robertson in 2015 off the axe, uh, which is pretty pleasing. Now we can say we're 134 years old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, in the last month, we bought the co-op bookshops as well. And and so um, we 
um, they went into administration at the end of last year, so we just picked them up too. So um, in 2015 to 2016, we kicked off a project to IPO. Um, we spent quite a lot of money attempting to do that, and the week that we were just getting our pricing, the prospectus had been finished, and we were going to market. Um, Amazon announced they were coming to Australia, and uh, all the fund managers said, well, they're going to annihilate you. We're not putting our money in. And so, uh, and so we had to kind of drop that idea. We then looked at um, other fundraising or, or uh, trade sales around the world, see if someone was interested in buying us, and no one was. So we kept growing, and then um, just think, sorry, just put that into context, right? Imagine being at 80 million plus 50, or going 50 million plus, and fighting for the. You think about all our efforts for raising capital, but just think of where that position is at and still going through that process. <laughs> Back then, though, they, um, everyone really, um, they just couldn't understand how we could compete against Amazon. And I get asked today, you know, has Amazon made an impact on your business? That'd be your first frequently asked question. <laughs> and so I love that question. Because what, what I try and do, I, I, I put on a very grave, a grave, yes, they have. We've doubled since they've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love it when they ask that question. Um, and so, so, um, so we, hadn't, we hadn't had a lot of success, but our customers loved us. And that was one of the things about the crowdfunding. And I thought, well, our customers love us. And some of them have even said, you know, Husey from the radio and TV, he said uh, when he was coming in to sign his book, mate, mate, I thought when you IPO, I was going to put my money in, mate. Um, and, uh, and so we're hearing a lot of that people wanting to invest. So we decided to go down the crowd, crowdfunding route, and and that was um, that was successful. But um, by kicking that off, I then got a call from one of your team members, I think it's Lee, Lee. and uh, about wholesale investor, and we thought, well, people were starting to say, you know, you know putting in. Thousand, two thousand. I want to put in more. And so we thought, well, why don't we speak to potentially some bigger and larger investors? So we did the wholesale investor uh, roadshow in uh, Sydney, Brisbane, and Singapore, and um, and then it was. I don't know how much more detail you want me to go in before we start asking questions, but uh, Mark Hayden, Mark oh, yeah, is here. So four uh, four backs. Mark, Mark is our finance director, um, and the reason um, Mark is with us is because in Around the middle of last year, I got this clear message, in, you know, this internal thought that these guys aren't investing because we don't speak their language. And we need to bring someone from outside, <coughs> inside the business, who's come from the capital markets, who can talk their language and present us um, to the market in a way that they can understand. Because I knew that Sir Stitch, uh, the guy that started that, was an investment banker. I think Temple and Webster was the same. I know the guys at Afterpay were really well. They all, all, had all come from the capital markets. We were entrepreneurs, we, we built businesses. So at the back of the room on the Sydney event at about 11 o'clock at night, um, it was bloody noisy. And it was a good party. Uh, it was bloody noisy. And I'm just moving further and further to the back of the room because it was just impossible to have a conversation. And a guy was standing next to me, and uh, and we got a bit of a conversation, and I invited him to come to Booktopia, and I explained to him my idea of, of, I think we need someone inside the tent. And he goes, I think I know someone, that was Mark. Mark came on board, and um, $20 million later, um, mission accomplished. Um, <laughs> but what, what Mark did was, um, was He's a bit like one of those stylists that you bring in to try and sell your house. You know, like, has anyone seen When Harry Met Sally, that movie, you know, and it's all about the coffee, the wagon wheel coffee table that's got it, you know, that's got to go. Um, and that picture over there, that is really, like, ugly. You cannot sell your house with So Mark looked at our business the way that an investor would look at it, and, and there was things that were missing, but we were mostly there. So it took a bit of work, it took about five months for us to get from coming on board to having their transaction complete. But it, the wholesale investor played their part. Everything played their part. I mean, obviously, you can't, you can't have one without the other. Um, so our Series A, 
Um, was it around 100 and 14 year old 14 Series A or 15 years old? 16 year Series A at 150 million in revenue. Um, yeah, so, so my brother was the one that gave me the $10 a day as my budget. And I always say, imagine if you gave me 20 bucks a day. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so that's, it's, it's been very much bootstrapped. In the beginning, people ask me, what do you want to start a bookstore for? You know, there's Amazon, there's Borders, there's Dimmicks, there's Angus and Robertson. You're too late, you know, 2004. I'm surprised one of the, the family offices didn't invest in one of the, like the, you know, the Dimmicks family offices. Speaks to Mark, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the first question I'll kick off with is, yeah. obviously, you're, you're, um, you would have experienced a decent amount of rejection through that period of, sort of 2015 to 2019. What was your thoughts as you were going through that? It's always, um, we just need to get bigger. Like, okay, you're just asking us to go that little bit further um, down the track. So, because we continued to grow and we didn't need anyone's money. I mean, the truth is we didn't need the money. Yeah. We, we, we're growing all that investment, all that software, the automation, the stock, that all came out of our own proceeds. We just wanted to get there faster. And by having the money, we knew that we could do that. It would shore up the model because having to generate the cash um, to fund everything yeah. means that you're always constrained. We get told, like we'll have communicated to us, and we talked about this yesterday, that um, you know, you're effectively raising money across a four year period, right? So, you know, we, we get told that oh, if, you, if you haven't finished your capital raising within a two to three months, there's something, there's something wrong. How did you handle that sort of perspective from advisors and investors that were telling you that? It's, things always come out, it's not even the capital raising, it's things come out of left field. Like you, if you're in business, you've got to be able to handle everything that gets thrown at you. So there's, there could be um, um, something that went on in the warehouse, there was a situation where the warehouse was too hot, and we had to spend $600,000 to put these jet engines on the roof to extract the heat and keep it at 29 degrees, otherwise everyone was going to go to their work. So it's, it's kind of like that, it's just like, it, I just felt that, um, you know, I haven't met the right, we haven't met the right people yet, so it was just um, no problem. And also, um, you know, one of the one of the guys that was part of this investment group <coughs> was there in the very beginning, and the opportunity to see us grow, it's, it's still educating. It's like, oh shit, I never thought they'd get that big. Okay, all right. Um, you know, I didn't expect that, so geez, I better get in now. So it's not, it's never a waste. Yeah, it's never. You're never when you're pitching. You're never wasting your time. You're always educating people about your business and giving them a point of reference in the future where they can compare and go. So in your mind, was anyone ever really out? All those people that hadn't actually said yes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You meet a lot of teachers along the way. <laughs> 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 like, but, I mean, you just know that there's a mismatch in philosophy. We'll keep that on the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there was people even at the wholesale investor. Um, I won't, I won't say who, of course. Yeah. Um, but. They just didn't get it. They just don't understand your model. It's not, it's not part of their background. Um, you know, some people say you don't have enough debt. Other people say you don't have enough this, you don't have enough that. They've all got their viewpoint because they're going off their experience base. So until you meet somebody, and the person that was the lead investor, it's in the paper, so Su Ming Wong, with his own private money, and he, he's the founder and the chairman of uh, Champ Ventures. And so he's invested in online. He's invested in internet from the very beginning. Companies like uh, Look Smart, to those of you that are old enough to remember. Um, he's invested in, in um, uh, Seek in the very beginning, Redbubble. He's invested in retail, he's invested in, in uh, Tarakash and, and Macpac and other companies. So when you're talking to someone who actually knows your business and can get it, it just gets a whole lot easier. Um, that was the truth. So when you connected, when you connected with him, what was his thesis on your business? And what was, or what did you communicate to him and what was his thesis? Okay, so first of all, you need to bring, you know, Mark has done business with Suming for many, many years. So they knew each other. Yeah. So therefore there's an element of trust. And then when uh, we brought him to the boardroom and gave him to a Mark to sweat, Suming and I just talked as Mark just philosophically. We didn't actually talk about the business. It was about what's your values. What's your? How do you operate? How do you deal with um, 
what, what's your family situation like? How do you how do you think about these kind of situations? So uh, he's a kind of investor that wants to know what the divorce is going to be like, not so much the uh, uh, the honeymoon and the romance. Um, so, um, and how is that as a process for you as a founder? Was that, that unusual? You were expecting it, or uh, it's it's more my sweet spot. Yeah, um, it's what I'm more. I like to do business with people that I like and, and feel comfortable with. It's, it's more complicated when someone is just really. I'm a three-dimensional thinker, so uh, most of the fund managers are two-dimensional. They're looking at so show me the numbers, right? Right. Um, geez, you should be making a lot more EBITDA out of that business if you're doing 100 million on 130. Uh, on a price times earnings ratio, um, and they'll go, I think you value the X. Like, um, but what about our trajectory? What about our you know, growing market share? What about our comparative set, like Timberland Webster at the moment, who is smaller than us, have a market cap of over 400 million, and a price to earnings ratio of 130 or something. So, if we were listed, we'd be valued around. Seven or eight million. Uh, so those guys are very two-dimensional, and they have to be sometimes because they're managing risk. So you need to deal with someone. Well, I needed to deal with someone in that case, like Sumi, who's a businessman as well as an investor. So you can see, you can think he's a three-dimensional thinker. Interesting. And if there was a, how much time do you have left for it to be done? If there was a, if there was advice that you would give to, to these guys going through their own journey, what would it be? Your own, your own journey to raising money, whether it be psychology, whether it be dealing with investors, whether it be um, ambition or resilience, or what would it be? Well, it's all of those things, but it depends where you're at. So for me, um, I'm, I believe in cash. So the more that you have money coming into your project, into your, into your idea, the less you need the money. So when you raise the money, then you're going to be able to use that other thing other than paying yourself a salary until you do the next raise, which is really, um, it's not the way that I think. I, I, I have to know that the money's going to fund everything and pay the salaries, and then I'm able to, to look at it. So that gives you freedom and independence. Uh, and a lot of people that were at, at the events, the hostile investor events that we were at, some people were pre-money, um, pre-profit, um, and so it's about being, to me it's about being so sustainable. A lot of the ideas I saw with, and I hear about over the years is, where's the money going to come from? I want to know that people are handing over cash, otherwise you've got no business. Um, that's super, super important. And be stress testing all the time. It's, Mark is with, with us now, but we've had other people who have given us feedback over the years where you're up to what's, you know, what's missing. What, we were looking at your platform before, Chris, and and I was the one question I asked was, do you have anyone like if you load all your stuff on there, do you have consultants to help you to polish off and finish the finish everything else because you don't know what you you don't know what's missing. So other people do. Is there any any questions anyone wants to ask I was wondering what's it like the public public company? Um, does that does that say I don't go more fifty share on the I don't care. The more transparent you are, to me it's like we're getting ready to be listed. So the more that you start behaving like a listed company, and like in the beginning, like when, this is an interesting one just to share with you. So when we hit um, 25 million in revenue and 50 million employees, um, our accountant said, all right, you need to get audited. And I said, nah, it's fine. Enough. Where? No, no. No, he goes, actually, you know, actually, you need to be audited. All right, what's the deal? How much is it going to Oh, well, we, we have an auditing division. It'll cost you 20 grand. And I said, well, what are our other options? And he says, well, you could do mid tier, you know, Grant Thornton, right? That's one thing. Or it's a big end of town, PwC, you know, um, KPMG, Deloitte's. Um, and we went with PwC from the outset. It was more expensive, but then they were stamping our financials right from the very, very beginning. And when I started to do, I have to go you know, four years later, everyone that you're meeting in the, in the, the capital markets, the fund managers, that was really clever. You know, that's, so 
it's about building something that someone wants to buy. So having the financials really, really tight. Um, and then when someone comes in, they've got a lot of confidence in the business. It's having systems and processes, documentation. Um, otherwise, you're just buying a shoebox with a lot of receipts and other things in there that you know, who knows what you get. Um, it's a little bit like a co-op. Um, um, but the, um, so that's why I don't see things, uh, I don't, it was no difference to me, maybe to someone else, but it was, unless the project limited or limited, uh, we paid them, do it earlier, because uh, although they've changed the laws now, but we actually had to pay, pay something like, I don't know, $1.8 million of stamp duty government um, to change over from price limited to a limited company so we can get ready for the IPO. So if, um, if you want a list, then I'd get it done earlier. Any other questions? Final opportunity for questions for today. Thank you very much, Tony. I said I really said I had for me it was really I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Happy that there was a, a, a sort of good outcome and obviously be good to watch you continue to grow. Thank you.